going to give you the punchline first, and then I'm going to kind of work back right, uh, backwards and justify the punchline. So the punchline is basically that whilst North Korea is probably one of the greatest challenges facing humanity today, whilst it's often seen as a very hopeless and unchanging issue, there's actually a lot of change happening. There's a lot of progress being driven. It's being driven by the North Korean people, and it's being driven in ways that can be supported by people like us. It can be accelerated and we can bring forward progress in North Korea. So this is obviously the traditional narrative on North Korea. This is what most people around the world, including in South Korea, would associate with North Korea. It's basically crazy Kim Jong-un with nuclear weapons. That's what sells in the international media. Uh, you know, the, the narrative is very securitized, it's very politicized. If the North Korean people are portrayed, then it's often as very brainwashed type robots, uh, fanatic loyalists, or just passive victims of this whole situation. But basically most of it is on this level of international politics and security issues. The issue with that is that it does seem very unchanging and uh, even impossible at that level of the issue. And this is because at the level of international politics, at the level of you know, security issues, high politics, whatever you want to call it, it basically is an impossible stalemate right now. So I'll read just a little bit of an uh, article that basically could have been written at any point in the last couple of decades, uh, just to kind of show how little it's changing. So the article goes, this is a New York Times article, but even as the administration vowed to seek sanctions, key elements of its plan remained unclear, including whether China would go along and what steps North Korea would have to take to end any sanctions that might be imposed. Administration officials, US administration, <coughs> said the sanctions needed to be painful enough to induce the North Koreans to reconsider the decision to proceed with the nuclear weapons program, whilst leaving open the possibility for a diplomatic solution, blah, blah, blah. China basically says, you know, let's calm down, let's put the brakes on this a little bit, uh, and uh, let's avoid confrontation. Does anybody want to guess when this article came out? Anybody, anyone be, anyone? Be brave. We have a journalist in the front. Mm -hmm. You want to guess? Uh, 2009. It could have been written, like, definitely 2009. It was actually written in 1994. <laughs> June 3rd, 1994. This article, literally this article, could have been written today. Uh, and, it, and, you know, 3rd of June 1994 is obviously nearly exactly 20 years ago. More recently, you have uh, Obama in his press conference in Tokyo just a couple of weeks ago saying, now, am I optimistic that, uh, that there's going to be a major strategic shift in North Korea's attitudes anytime soon? Probably not. So at least he's being a little bit honest. He's being, he's being realistic. Uh, you know, he says, we're not, uh, hold on. We can continue to apply more and more pressure on North Korea so that at some juncture, they end up taking a different course. He goes on to say, we're not surprised when they engage in irresponsible behavior. That's been their pattern for the last couple of decades. And what we have to do is continue to, make, uh, to contain and mitigate the, the potential damage that this behavior has and continue to put pressure on them so that we can see a shift. So you've had very much the same approach from the international community, from the US government, from Beijing. It's always a little bit wild card because you go back and forth between left wing and right wing. But, but basically the same picture for the last 20 years. So this is why this is a stalemate. Fundamentally, the fundamental positions of the actors are irreconcilable. The US government's uh, fundamental position is North Korea must denuclearize. North Korea's fundamental position is you've got to be crazy if you think we're going to denuclearize. And frankly, they would be crazy if they denuclearized. That's what they've learned from the, uh, from the international environment uh, over the last few decades. Even more recently, you know, with incidents like Libya, even the Ukraine. Uh, there's, there's plenty of lessons that show them that rationally, actually, they should uh, keep their nuclear weapons for their own selfish, you know, Pyongyang interests. So, really at this level, you don't have people trying to move towards solutions. The Six Party Talks, it's, it's almost a joke when people bring up the Six Party Talks at this point. It's really just problem management at this stage. Nobody's really pushing for solutions. 
And so the problem of really focusing on the security aspects is that this, this plays into the North Korean regime's strengths and it uh, promotes this narrative that this is a very undynamic, unchanging, hopeless and impossible issue. Thankfully, that's not the only level of the issue, right? Just in, in, like, in a lot of uh, forms of problem solving, if one aspect of the problem is impossible, then you can look for another side of the problem, which maybe you know, more progress is possible. So within this, within looking at the, you know, the level of the North Korean people, in contrast to the level of international politics, over the last 20 years, it's a completely different place. North Korean society is completely different to how it was in 1994. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of changes. There's these economic, social, and information changes that we've identified by, uh, by discussing these things with North Korean refugees that we work with. And uh, these seem to be unstoppable, irreversible, long-term, and eventually, we think, will lead to a transformation of North Korea in our lifetime. So the first long-term unstoppable change that's happening in North Korea is bottom-up marketization. The context to this, the bigger picture context, hope that's okay. <laughs> the bigger picture context is that North Korean economy was traditionally one of the, you know, probably one of the most demonetized economies in human history, uh, you know, before the 1990s. But then, for a lot of reasons that I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, because a lot of you have been uh, attending this series from the start, the North Korean economy, the, the state socialist sector of the North Korean economy, collapsed in the 1990s. And that was nearly all of the economy. So, uh, where, uh, whereas before, you know, people expected the government to provide food for them through the, through the uh, public distribution system, all of a sudden, that food wasn't coming through. And so, people had to fend for themselves. People basically had to take the economy into their own hands. And so you had this basic uh, de facto capitalization or marketization of the North Korean economy. Another thing that happened, not just you know, at the grassroots level, people foraging and, and engaging in cottage industry, one example of that would be a North Korean woman that I know, a North Korean born woman that I know, was working in a shoe factory for the North Korean government. That factory ceased to function in the mid 1990s. And so uh, with, you know, with it ceasing functioning and, and not providing any kind of rations, she, there was no point in going to work there anymore and there was no way to survive on those wages. So she just took some of those supplies from the factory, took them home and started making shoes at home and then sold them. So that's one example, one micro example of how the state socialist economy became basically privatized and you had different uh, you know, private business activities arising. Also at the same time, individual regime institutions or agencies inside the country were basically broke and they had to start uh, making their own budget for themselves. There wasn't like a central pot of money like in a normal functioning <coughs> government. Every single institution basically turned into, uh, you can think of it as like its own company and they had to start fending for themselves and they had to start working with the private sector. So for instance, a construction company uh, in North Korea has to often lend money from people with money who are called tonju, people who own money in North Korea, in order to make that construction happen. And then the payoff for the investor is that they get like their pick of the best uh, apartments in that block. So it's a very capitalist uh, system in this you know, constrained kind of higgledy-piggledy uh, capitalist economy. One of, the, uh, one of the aspects of this is that most of these market behaviors are still illegal. So you have to engage in market activities in order to survive in, in North Korea, but it's all illegal. So you basically have to break the rules and break the laws in order to survive, in order to get ahead. Anybody engaging in any kind of private business is probably breaking some kind of law, breaking some kind of rule. So at a mass scale, people are engaged in non-compliance and disobedience against government control. Again, that's often different to how the international media would portray the North Korean people. So in the long term, the government has at, uh, at certain points tried but failed to regain control over the, uh, over the economy. 
the most recent example being the 2009 currency revaluation, which ended up being a disaster, and we could talk about that a little bit more in the discussion. Uh, so they've tried and failed to bring it under control, and now basically they have to accept it, uh, learn to live with it for the long term, and adapt to it. Another point that's really relevant here is not only have they lost control of the economy, but the economy is actually growing in North Korea. The North Korean economy is improving over the last 10 years. Again, that's not you know, a very common comment, but that does seem to be the, the case. Uh, again, talking with North Korean refugees, that's not because of the North Korean government's policies, it's in spite of the North Korean government's policies. It's because of this you know, burgeoning capitalist economy which is being driven by the North Korean people. So the North Korean government has lost control of the economy which is growing. That points to a really severe regime system weakness uh, that the leadership has to deal with. Yeah, that's all. The next, the next major change is corruption. Uh, again, we often think of North Korea as this very effective lockdown police state. But in order to have a very effective police state, you need to have the central government being in control of local level police enforcement and the security apparatus. That's not the case in North Korea. In North Korea, the central government does not control the behavior of local level officials because basically they're broke. They're, they're, they're not getting wages and so they're engaging in corruption in, in order to survive. So if you look at it like internationally, uh, people that do research on, you know, comparative research on corruption in different countries, they identify several factors that increases the likelihood of uh, corruption in any, uh, any given system. And these include things like uh, poverty, having uh, you know, a huge bureaucracy or a big government, having uh, you know, poor government officials, having barriers to business and red tape in general. Obviously in North Korea, the whole country is basically, you know, the whole bureaucracy is a barrier to business because most of it's illegal. Uh, and also having low accountability. So if you have a country that doesn't have pr uh, free press, then that's something that enables uh, corruption to happen because there's less of a deterrent and there's less of a way to root it out through media attention. <coughs> and then the last thing is having a profitable, illegal or gray sector in the country. That increases corruption. So North Korea basically has all of the conditions that you would look for if you wanted to have a lot of corruption. So it leads to this uh, situation whereby North Korean refugees consistently tell us that you have, first of all, you have to break the rules in order to get by, but if you have money, then you can break any rule that you want. So let's talk about uh, some prices. Let's talk about some examples of some of these bribes. One little caveat on this is that, of course, bribing, uh, this is a very you know, informal activity, and so it depends on who you are, time and place, and it depends on the crackdowns that are happening, so there's a lot of variation. And also, it's not just in cash. This could be in gifts. Uh, bribes are given in cigarettes, in meat, in LCD TVs, uh, in, in all sorts of things you could, you could uh, pay a bribe in. But an example uh, of some of these bribes would be some people are paying bribes to their basically like factory foremen so that they don't have to go to work. So if you're a North Korean male, then you probably have to have a, an official job with the government sector. But there's no point in going there because most of the factories are not operating and you're not really getting the rations from that system. So you're effectively paying them so you don't have to go to work. There's a system that's kind of uh, emerged whereby that happens. So uh, if you pay roughly about $7, then you can not go to work for a month and then engage in your own you know, private business uh, activities. It's a lot more profitable. Same thing, a lot of people know that uh, freedom of movement is an issue in North Korea, but for instance, if you wanted to travel within the same province, then in order to uh, buy a travel permit, it might cost less than $1. If you wanted to travel towards the border area, that there's, there's more security checks on that, that might cost around $8. If you wanted to travel to a different province, from one province to another province, it might be about $3. And to travel from one of the provinces to Pyongyang, uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of checks on that. And so that might cost $16. So, you know, in the North Korean economy, to some people, 
These are decent sums of money. But if you're engaging in trade, then that's probably uh, affordable. And basically, you know, it's, it's pretty cheap because all you're doing is paying somebody a small bribe and they're just stamping a piece of paper and giving it to you. It's very low cost for that. It doesn't, it doesn't cost them a lot of effort uh, or risk. Similar, uh, you know, along the same lines, I spoke with a former, you know, fairly senior regime official, kind of party cadre type guy, Kambu. Uh, he wanted to get a promotion uh, in, into like a high position. The reason why he wanted to get that prom uh, promotion was not really the status so much, you know, the, the status of getting the promotion. It was so that he would have more people under him that would be giving him bribes. So that was his motivation to get the promotion in the first place. In order to get the promotion, he wanted to travel to China and get money from relatives in China so he could pay for that promotion. So that's how endemic corruption is within the system. Again, another example from a, a fairly recent North Korean refugee that I spoke with was that this was a guy who was engaged in private business that required having a Chinese mobile phone that was smuggled across the border so he could make contacts uh, to people in China and people in South Korea. That was part of his business. One day, and, and if you're doing that kind of thing, then you're going to have officials in your pocket in the first place. One day he was unlucky and got caught by an, an official who was not in his pocket. And so, first of all, he had to pay about uh, 3,000 RMB. So roughly, I think at the time it was like 500 US dollars just to avoid punishment. So he had the basic interrogation, but then he, he, he got away with that uh, by paying $500. Not only that, he'd lost his phone, it had been confiscated from him. So he went back to the same official and said, hey, kind of need that phone back, could I buy it from you? The answer, of course, was yes, and that was uh, $300 to buy the phone back. A couple of months later, he needed another phone. Uh, you know, these guys are, are using different phones on different networks, or maybe he lost his phone or something. So he went back to the same official and he was like, hey, thanks for selling that phone last time. Do you happen to have any other phones that you confiscated that I could buy? He did, and so again, he paid a few hundred dollars and he bought that phone. Last one, uh, related to foreign media, is, and this changes quite a lot, but an example of if you get caught, uh, you get busted in a raid by security agents who are responsible for trying to root out foreign media, uh, and you're watching South Korean dramas on DVD, then you might have to pay between about 300 and 500 US dollars. So it's obviously a lot of money in the North Korean economy, but if you have that, then it's totally worth paying people off. You know, the, the, the factors that are gonna influence that are how many officials tend, you know, just happen to bust into your house at the time. If it's more officials, you have to pay more money. Uh, and obviously, if there's crackdowns at the time, then that might uh, push the prices up as well. What these examples of corruption tell me is that the culture of corruption in North Korea is that it's basically assumed, it penetrates every level and every sector, it's disintegrating the effectiveness of the North Korean police state, especially in the areas of economic and information related crimes. Not only does corruption open up space for people to escape around uh, the regime's uh, restrictions, but it's actually also increasing frustration because from an, from an ordinary North Korean point of view, or ordinary North Korean person's point of view, it's clearly an illegitimate uh, you know, system that these North Korean police and party cadres are benefiting from. And so you know, North Korean refugees often say that party cadres are, you know, you, you feel jealous of them, you may feel angry towards them, uh, even though you're kind of benefiting from this corrupt system, it's very unjust and it causes com uh, frustration within the system. So, again, in the long game, the, this phenomenon of rampant corruption, it opens up space for the North Korean people to evade these constraints and the North Korean government's uh, attempts to micromanage society in a way that actually constrains development. So it enables uh, space to open up for people to create change and actually drive progress within this horrible governance system. It's also uh, increasing uh, frustration with that system, and it's basically enabling mass non-compliance amongst the populace uh, towards the rules of the system. So the North Korean regime, faced with this reality, cannot recover the control over the rule of law without basically transforming their system, 
there's no way to recover this at this point without really having a, a big change in their system. The, the third big change would be uh, the information flows. So the context of this again is that, as we all know, the North Korean government has gone to a, uh, a lot of lengths to try and make their country the most closed media environment in the world. That's because they think that they're maintaining and protecting their ideology is very important for maintaining the, their legitimacy and for controlling the people. However, the big change is that since the 1990s, you have a lot of people flows, both pro, uh, cross-border into China and back, and also within North Korea, and you have a lot of information technologies that are facilitating uh, access to foreign media. So some examples of this, again, I'll, I'll just throw out a few, a few prices. DVD players, there's the traditional DVD players, that might set you back about 20 US dollars. So if you're, sub, if you're above like surviving day to day, then this is one of the first things that you might uh, buy in North Korea, a DVD player for 15 to 20 uh, US dollars. Buying the actual DVD itself might be as little as five to 10 Chinese yuan, and so that's about uh, 80 to 80 cents to one dollar sixty. This is really cheap for the for the DVD itself, from our perspective. Uh, and you know these are sold, for instance, in the front of the chamadan, and you just go up to somebody and you're like, hey, do you have like some chaminago? And then you know, <laughs> they might have something and they sell it, sell it to you. Also, an interesting thing is that uh, when new films come across, the price might drop. The the price of that disc might drop within a week. So it shows how quickly the, the discs are spreading and that that becomes you know, less favorable because people are all watching it and then they're selling their copy and so the price is dropping uh, that quickly. You also have USB sticks. Uh, most people tend to use four, uh, four gigabyte uh, capacity USBs in North Korea and that would put you back like about $6.50. The benefit of USB over DVD is fairly obvious, which is easier to carry around, you can delete the content, it's easier to evade surveillance. Another really significant technology is the portable DVD players. So that's kind of like the, the thing, uh, second from end. Uh, in North Korea, they're often called note or note and that's a portmanteau of no from like notebook, note com, and tell from television. So it's like a notebook television. That's, that seems to be a North Korean word that, they, that people there made, it, made up themselves. The really great thing about this is that the whole thing is small enough to hide in your closet and also it has an internal battery source. So even if the power goes out, which is a big constraint to consuming foreign media in North Korea, you can carry on watching it on its own battery or you can connect it to a car battery, which a lot of people have in North Korea. So again, it will go, go to the next slide. So again, people are increasingly aware of the outside world. They're increasingly and painfully aware of North Korea's comparative backwardness co uh, towards, uh, compared to China or South Korea. And they're increasingly aware of the reasons for that poverty. Basically, that it's not because of the weather or something like that. It's because their country, their, their state, has refused to open up in the same way that China has, which uh, has, has allowed China to obviously accelerate catch up to them and accelerate away from them. In the long term, the North Korean government, even if they crack down, can only really slow down this, this information flow. They can buy a little bit more time, but they can't stop it. So they've lost control and are increasingly losing control over what the North Korean people know and what they're thinking about. As the understanding of that reality diverges away from the traditional reality, you get this, this divergence which is dangerous for the North Korean government because the ideology uh, increasingly becomes irrelevant and maybe even counterproductive to instilling loyalty towards the people. Briefly on uh, the role of defectors, because I'll try and come back to this. The role of North Korean defectors and, and obviously uh, NKSC and many of the groups here and, and our organization work in North Korean defectors one of the ways of understanding how powerful North Korean factors can be as an agent of change is that uh, the comparison just between South Korea and North Korea is that South Korea's per capita GDP is roughly on a par with countries like Israel, 
uh, New Zealand and the average EU uh, per capita GDP. North Korea's per capita GDP is roughly on a par with Zambia and Benin. Imagine putting Zambia in the middle of the EU and then having people jumping the fence into the EU, sending money back home, uh, making contact, sending information back home into a state which is trying to say basically, fundamentally, that they're doing well compared to the outside world. That's not going to be good for the Zambian government in the middle of the EU in that situation. So that's, you know, that's one way of understanding the difference between North Korea and South Korea, the potential role uh, <coughs> North Korean refugees can have. Again, the North Korean government is obviously trying to stop this. They've increased the crackdowns on the border security again since 2012, but, and, and they've been partially successful, but in the long term, unless they, again, transform their system, you get real development happening in North Korea, people are going to risk their lives in order to escape from that political and economic oppression that's happening in the country. So this is going to be a long-term trend again. The fifth change is uh, one of my, my kind of favorite uh, change phenomena in the country. This is the Changmadan generation. Basically, uh, you know, generation change is, all, is often a factor in political change happening in different countries. And every generation is always different to the previous generation. However, sometimes history just changes a little bit more and creates a different society which really accent, uh, accentuates, is that the right word? accentuates the generation difference. So in, in uh, the Changnan generation, which is basically people born in the 1980s or 1990s, so people who were in their 20s, maybe up to early 30s, these people grew up in a North Korea where, you know, it's basically the post Kim Il-sung North Korea, post PDS, you know, functioning PDS, North Korea, where they were not uh, receiving rice and, you know, the, the uh, living from the government. They had to engage in market activities to do that. And also they were faced with this unprecedented influx of foreign media for the first time. And so a lot of these people, you know, they might have been in high school when a lot of these new South Korean and Chinese DVDs and USBs started coming in. And just like young people everywhere, they have a high tolerance to risk, and they're very curious about learning about the outside world. And so there's a lot of foreign media consumption, especially within this generation. A lot of times, increasingly, this is shared. People are watching with their friends. They're discussing it. They're even mimicking the South Korean accent amongst young, you know, young North Koreans. It's kind of cool if you've watched a lot of those things, uh, and so on. So they're engaged in... Uh, a lot of shared illegal behaviors, shared kind of, it's not explicitly anti-government, but it is running against the will and the, and the controls of the government, the, these kind of behaviors. And they have a fundamentally different relationship with the North Korean state. Again, you know, it's probably the older generation which is really maintaining the system. It's people born in the 1950s, 60s, maybe 70s, the older generation which is maintaining the current system. As this generation continues to grow, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, it's going to become increasingly difficult for the North Korean government to maintain control through their traditional propaganda and means of social controls. The sixth one is... Well, how many time? Okay. The sixth one is the emergence of uh, human networks inside North Korea. Again, the context of this <coughs> is that the North Korean government has gone to uh, extreme, amazing lengths to try and control personal relationships and place personal relationships within the purview of the North Korean state. So every kind of organization comes under basically the Korean Workers' Party in some way. You know, whether it be like the Association of you know, Married Women or uh, you know, the, the Kim Il-sung, uh, whatever it's called, Revolutionary League, Socialist League. Um, all of these organizations are placed within the control and within the purview of the North Korean government so that they can monitor it and so that they can try and control it. However, the change here is that with the emergence of the markets, with the emergence of private business, and with the emergence of foreign media and different sources of information, people have started to rely on each other and form these human networks which are actually outside of the government control. And they may even be explicitly you know, skirting around or running against 
the will of the government. So if you're engaged in private business, you may be, you maybe have like a whole company or a few people. Uh, you know, you, you have like one guy who's sitting controlling the stock. You have other guys who are couriers. You have other guys that are salesmen. These are all people that are engaged in a network of private business, which is outside of the government system. The significance of this in the long term seems to be that whilst there aren't any kind of non-government organizations at this point, these networks could be really important in overcoming the atomization, the traditional atomization of the North Korean people and accelerating collective empowerment uh, to, to enable the North Korean people to push for real change inside the country. In any system, in any government system, it's more or less impossible for one person to push for change. However, if you manage to get people together, then there's no kind of change that they can't push for if you get enough people that are empowered that can put uh, <coughs> together. So this could be a really, really interesting kind of game changer in the long run. However, it's not all good news. So we've gone through six, uh, what seem to be major, unstoppable, irreversible trends which are pushing for change within the system. However, it's not all good news. There are really serious structural factors that slow down change. This is probably why we haven't seen you know, more change in North Korea so far. The first one would be just the level of brutality of control over public politics in North Korea. So in North Korea, you don't have any kind of political dissenter. You don't have an Aung San Suu Kyi, or you know, an Ai Weiwei, or a Liu Xiaobo, or a Percy Riot, or any of these kinds of people. In all of those other countries, you have some kind of, they may, they may be put under uh, house arrest, they may be beaten up every now and then, but there's some kind of voice which exists within, this, uh, within the system, within the country, which has a different voice. In North Korea, there's no known you know, political dissenter, inside, or, or dissident, I should say, within the country. This is obviously enforced, as I'm sure you all know, by the uh, by North Korean police state, which is not able to really control economic and information-related uh, crimes, but it's still quite good at uh, hunting down and dealing with political-related subversion, and obviously the deterrence of political prison camps. You know, North Korea has uh, one of the highest rates of political uh, political prisoner. Uh, incarceration in, in human history, uh, you know, maybe around 100,000 people right now out of 24 million people, and the system of collective punishment, which still exists today. So all of these things basically raise the costs uh, for pushing for political change and also make it less likely that uh, you're going to be successful. So it, so it seems to be that this kind of thing would make radical change, you know, very quick radical change, very difficult at this point in time. Maybe the change will be more gradual. The other thing is, and I'll uh, skip past this a little bit, but maybe come back to it. Um, basically, in North Korea, you have a ruling minority elite of maybe 10% of the people. It may be 1 to 2 million people. Most of them uh, reside in Pyongyang. And if you like, you, one way of looking at them is that they're actually like a ruling my, uh, minority, like almost like ethnic group by this point. They don't have an ethnic like, identity, but because of the Songbun system, if you're within this uh, top ruling elite, then it's not just you, it's your whole family, it's all of your cousins, it's a lot of the people that you know. So, it's, so there's some characteristics whereby, for instance, in Syria, this is one of the reasons why change in Syria is happening, uh, you know, it's, it's very tortuous right now, and there's a really fierce civil war happening, is because you have actually a similar size population. You have about 20 million Syrians. Within that, you have a very small minority of Alawites who have everything to lose if the system gets uh, flipped over. Because the Sunni majority will take over and the, the current ruling, major, uh, ruling minority will have no place. People in the top 10% in North Korea face that same rational fear of a system collapse. They could all lose their jobs, their liberty, they could be incarcerated, they could lose their status, you know, their power, all the networks that they rely on, all of these things, because a collapse in North Korea could lead to an absorption, reunification from Seoul. 
So all of the Pyongyang elites could lose everything, basically. And that this makes them uh, very cohesive. It makes them, uh, you know, it, it increases the likelihood that they'll fight against that kind of revolutionary change uh, very fiercely. However, on the flip side, it may be, you know, if I was Kim Jong-un or one of his advisors, it might give me the confidence a little bit to actually open up the system a little bit because you have such a strong, basically, political base uh, around you. You have, you know, maybe one to two million people that really, at the top of the pyramid, that really want to preserve the system. They want to preserve the system, but a lot of these people are also going to want to liberalize uh, this within the system. They don't want to flip the system over, but they want to see improvements within that system so that basically they can make more money and they can lead uh, a little bit more stable and less arbitrary lives. You know, these people don't want to be, you know, watching over their shoulder either for, you know, uh, uh, becoming under suspicion for political crimes or, you know, having the, the level of illiberalization that means that if they watch something fun from South Korea, then they might lose everything. So they want to push for change within the system, but they don't necessarily want to flip it over. So in the bigger picture, you have these economic information and social changes happening. People are gradually breaking away from the state. All of this uh, points to deep-rooted system-level changes. And, uh, the, and it also points to long-term people-driven changes that we can work with. Next one. The first one would be working with North Korean defectors. So, as a lot of you will know, my organization, Liberty in North Korea, Link, uh, operates in the so-called Underground Railroad. We bring free North Korean refugees. These are some of the people that we've worked with. Obviously, a lot of times we have to uh, you know, protect their identity. This is roughly the route that nearly everybody's taking these days. And as I said, they have a really important role to play because they're acting as a bridge community back into North Korea. Again, if you look at the kind of changes that are happening in North Korea, one of the best ways to instigate more change or accelerate those changes would be to get more information to the North Korean people and to get more money and resources to the North Korean people, directly to the North Korean people, if possible, right? and, and subverting the uh, government level. The great thing is, is that North Korean refugees are actually experts at that, and they do it in a very organic, very decentralized, and very efficient way. So, for instance, I know, you know several North Korean refugees that have been able to send back thousands of dollars, even $5,000, within their first year of resettlement in South Korea. I was recently spending a little bit of time with one of, our, one of the North Korean refugees that we work with, resettled refugees, and he sent back, he uh, came through uh, China and South Korea in 2010, he sent back over $10,000 since then to his family. When this money goes back in, and it's, you know, we can discuss that, that exact mechanism later on if people are interested, when it goes back in, it's fueling the grassroots marketization of the country even more than you'd expect, because if you're a North Korean family and all of a sudden you get $1,000 or $2,000, you're not just going to, and it's normally in uh, Chinese yuan, you're not just going to sit on it and then spend it gradually because that might, you know, look suspicious and, you know, draw unwanted jealousy and attention. So you're probably going to actually launder it through your business activities. So, for instance, you know, again, a North Korean uh, refugee told me that her sister was uh, abroad and sending money back to her. The first time she got money uh, through, it was a few hundred dollars. She just took care of her baby's needs, you know, food and clothes for her baby. The second time, she bought a bicycle so that she could you know, travel further, more quickly, go to more markets more quickly. <coughs> the third time, she actually bought a whole house that was just closer to the market so that she could you know, empower and speed up her market activities. So this money that's going through... Next one, please. Yeah, so according to a few surveys, it seems like about half of North Korean refugees are maintaining contact in this way. And if you add it up, let's say a half out of about 26,000, even if it's just $1,000 per person per year, and it's probably more than that a lot of the time, then 13,000 times 1,000 would be 13 million, and it's probably at the higher end of that, right? You know, a 
according to my own like back of the paper, back of the envelopes uh, calculations. The second, hold on, let me just, uh, yeah, okay. So the second, uh, sorry, I forgot to accelerate information reports. The second way, which is exactly you know the kind of thing that NKSC is uh, engaged in, is accelerating access to information for the North Korean people. This is, in a way, a really obvious thing. You know, North Korean refugees consistently tell us that this is one of the things that has to happen. You need to change the information environment. You need to change the North Korean people's awareness of the outside world and of their own country in order to accelerate change inside North Korea. Uh, the the impact of that on people's awareness is quite obvious, but it's interesting to note as well that information flows interact with some of the other social changes. So for instance, the more information flows you introduce and the more foreign media you get in, you're going to strengthen some of those human networks as well, because people are relying on each other for that uh, foreign media, and the more people are sharing, borrowing, discussing, watching together that foreign media, the more you're strengthening those human networks. Also, foreign media is encouraging even more marketization inside the country. This is one of the things that you know, encourages like a consumerist mindset or a, or a market mindset because if you see these dramas and people are wearing you know, different kinds of clothes, then those kind of clothes quite quickly become uh, more popular in the markets. We, you know, again, this is the kind of stuff that we hear from North Korean refugees. Of course, the regime is not happy about this. They're trying to crack down. It's sometimes really interesting. I wouldn't read out a whole long, long quote, but it's sometimes really interesting to read the official North Korean kind of propaganda on why they need to keep this out. There's a certain internal logic, but basically it's about we need to protect our ideology because our ideology is really important for maintaining the socialist revolution and blah, 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 maintaining the system. Um, but in the long run, it's really hard for the North Korean government to stop these things. I would say impossible. The amount of change that we've seen over the last 10 years has been incredible. In the next 10 years, you can only guess the, the new kind of technologies that are going to emerge and are going to you know, empower the North Korean people to learn even more about the outside world, to think, think and act for themselves independently of the regime. And like I said, the more you change the information environment inside the country, the more you force the regime to adapt their propaganda, to align more closely with reality, uh, and actually, in the long run, even allow a better standard of living to the North Korean people, because that's the only way that they can really maintain long-term control and legitimacy uh, with the North Korean people. And if they don't do that, then <coughs> they will lose control of the ideology and ultimately lose control of the ideology. So the more you increase that kind of divergence between ideology and people's awareness of reality, the more you, you make it difficult for the North Korean uh, government to maintain their current system. Next one. Um, the last way is um, basically, this is one of the big things that we're engaged with at LINK, Liberty North Korea, is trying to change the way that the world sees North Korea. It's fairly simple. Basically, we think that there's an outrageous lack of groups, lack of NGOs, and people working in support of the North Korean people. If you compare this to the scale of the challenge, or if you compare this to some other issues around the world, it's a really small number of people that are working on this. Why? I think it's because of the way this issue has been framed, the way it's been heavily securitized, heavily politicized. So can you go to the next one? So the more we can work with the media, with the international media, so I'm, you know, for instance, working with journalists, the more we can produce our own media, which puts the focus on the people, and then put that into the audience kind of in a bottom-up way, then the more we can show that actually there is hope, that actually the North Korean people are kind of amazing, and they're driving this change within a very difficult system, and there are things, and, and once you get that idea out there, you, people will realize that there are things that we can actually do to you know, help support those changes, help support the North Korean people as they drive progress. So, in conclusion, again, this is one of the biggest challenges facing humanity today, but progress is happening. And that progress is happening from the bottom up, and it's being driven by the North Korean people. Faced with probably one of the worst uh, systems of governance in the world, 
The people are increasingly breaking away. They've developed habitual disobedience towards that system, and they're forcing a de facto partial liberalization and opening of their country in spite of the regime's efforts. Ultimately, these changes seem to be irreversible and increasingly not just at an individual, but at a shared uh, and networked and normalized way. So if you put all, of the, all those things together, it doesn't really bode well for the long-term sustainability of the current regime system. So in the long run, it looks like one way or another, and that's a, that's a key word, one way or another, it looks like this will lead to a, ch a political level change, a change in the governance system. Because the way the North Korean economy is right now, the way North Korean society is right now, and the way even the North Korean people's minds are right now, they can't put them back into the North Korean system and control them the way it is. So they're going to have to adapt to that system and try and co-opt these new economic and social realities. Try and co-opt and adapt to uh, these changes that are happening. That's the only way in the long run that they can maintain long-term stability, it seems. One thing to point out is that actually the North Korean regime leadership does seem to be sensitive to these kinds of changes. You know, North Korean society has always been changing and it, uh, it, you know, if you look at 2000 and uh, 2002, uh, slight opening, 2005, pushback, 2009, currency reform, even more recently, two th you know, the policy changes in 2012 and, uh, and last year. These are all uh, reactions to what's happening in North Korean society. Sometimes it's regressive, it's in the direction of trying to control change, and sometimes it's going with some of these changes. So the question doesn't seem to be, you know, will the North Korean government try and adapt to these changes? It seems to be, will their efforts to adapt to these changes be sufficient, and will they be able to adapt uh, and stay on top of an opening society? Last slide, please. Oh, sorry. And again. So, again, if we focus not on the impossibility of this issue, but on the North Korean people, if we focus on not just the strengths of the North Korean regime system, but on the many structural weaknesses of the regime system, then we can see the potential for progress that comes from the North Korean people, and we can identify quite clear, very practical, and currently under-resourced strategies that we can implement in order to bring forward change in North Korea. So ultimately, this is why I said right up top, that I believe that the North Korean people will achieve their liberty in our lifetime and that there are things that all of us can do to help bring that change forward. Thank you. So we'd now like to open up the floor to, to questions. Um, so raise your hand, and Dan will be the microphone. Yeah, so um, thank you for your talk. You brought up a lot of very exciting points. Um, and before you go on, let's limit just to one question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You didn't mention the, the nuclear issue at all. I think that was on purpose, uh, although it seems like with... Um, uh, the amount of resources that officially spent on, uh, on on nuclear deterrence that provides a defense against uh, potential Japanese, American, or South Korean uh, military threat, but it's probably weakening the government because it's so resource intensive. And uh, the uh, I, I would actually like to know though uh, in in South Korea. Uh, when South Korea was developing very rapidly, uh, among uh, diaspora populations of, of Korean Japanese and Korean Americans, uh, the care, care system was instrumental in maximizing uh, limited, I, I guess, uh, informal capital mm -hmm. when, when institutional capital in the form of traditional bank loans was not available for various reasons. I was wondering if, if there's evidence of, of this system being exploited in North Korea. Uh, to, to maximize that limited informal capital? 
I've not heard of something that's like very much like the K, you know, that you know, traditional. It's like a microfinance system, right? It's like yeah. a traditional Korean microfinance system. Um, I've not heard that, no. Uh, but in the long run, that would seem to be like a potentially powerful thing. Maybe you, maybe you just don't really have the, uh, you know, the kind of social capital, if you like, or social infrastructure to allow that. Um, you need, you know, you need fairly stable communities in order to make that kind of thing work. There is, however, you know, there's things like credit and lending money in North Korea in a very informal way. There's like, you, basically, there's no banking system in North Korea, like, you know, for all, all intents and purposes. But if you're a businessman and you prove yourself to be trustworthy, then you can lend money within that system from basically from like informal loan shark type people. Uh, so that so there is a system of like informal bar, uh, banking um, and credit in that way. Oh, uh, hi. Yes. Um, uh, this. <laughs> okay. Um, my name's Jason, and uh, uh, first, thank you for everything you do and uh, for speaking with us tonight. Um, I was thinking about since you brought it up. Um, that there isn't really a civil society in North Korea, of course, and also that the the situation with the local governments and the regional governments is very strange because they don't seem to have much control. Uh, well, they they don't have the central government does not control these local governments and regional governments very well. But then at the same time, they're very scared to do a lot of things on their own. Um, and for instance, the Hans Seidel Foundation works with an organization called United Cities and Local Governments to try to help these municipal governments with things like wastewater treatment or something. And uh, this seems like it could be a good opportunity for civil society to work with them because when you look at China, um, civil society, they can't go around very many political issues. They can go around, well, we really don't want to build this plant because of pollution or something like that. So mm -hmm. people get together in that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you think this, uh, for improving municipal life, local life, regional life, would be a good opportunity to sort of give a bump to civil society in North Korea. And if that's happening at all already. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily know if I would put it at the, like, local government initiative type way, but um, I think that the, the comparison with China is relevant in the sense that in China you have a lot of protests and pushbacks against local like single issues, right? Like not in my backyard type stuff or like local corruption or local pol uh, pollution and that kind of stuff. I do think that that's the kind of thing where you might see the, you know, the, the emergence of like low level pushback. So, and there has been some evidence of that happening on things like housing issues. And that's the kind of thing that you would expect it to happen in as well, actually. So, um, without, you know, not, not going into too many details, but basically, just like in China a lot of the time, if the, if the government comes in and says, hey, you guys all have to leave, like we're demolishing all of these houses so we, we can expand the square around the Kim Il-sung statue, or, you know, we're coming in and some you know, senior officials said that the balconies on this apartment were ugly and so we have to take them all off. Those, those are both actually real examples. In those, six, in those circumstances, sometimes you will get residents spontaneously pushing back and even in a collective way. So the uh, apartment balcony example was that the local government officials maybe didn't realize that those people, those residents, were actually really dependent on those balconies because they were doing like urban farming essentially on those balconies. And so that was, the, the <clears> government was taking away uh, something that they were relying on. And that's obviously one of the times when you get the most pushback when something's taken away from you. And so people push back. I actually don't know how that, you know, how that result, what they ended up winning. But it is the kind, of, it does seem like it may be the kind of thing. Um, and, and, and corruption, for instance, that's something that people will fight back against local corrupt officials that they think are acting in a very unjust way. You know, whether they win or not, you know, depends on the depends on the case. But it is kind of the first things that you see pushback on. It's not uh, pushback on trying to overthrow the system. 
it's pushed back on local uh, single issues amongst a certain community. Uh, you pointed out uh, the coerciveness of the leadership as one of the obstacles, and uh, I took that as the implication of your presentation that you probably expected or, or uh, hoped for a bottom up movement as the ultimate changer. And I recently talked to a uh, defector who was a former Gangu, and he suggested a different scenario he thought was the ideal, which is that uh, there might be a, a sort, of, sort of a coup d'etat from the leadership, and he gave the reason, uh, as a reason that the, the, the Kim Jong-un's leadership was radically different from that of Kim Jong-il, in that Kim Jong-il was a, almost a genius in maintaining his own you know, close circle of loyal followers, whereas Kim Jong-un is employing a sort of reign of terror, which is you know, obviously not really tenable mm -hmm. in the long term. So, and he thought it was a real possible possibility that there might be some, I don't know, fearful uh, person around him who, who might stage a coup d'etat or an assassination, something like that. So how do you think that the change in leadership style might affect the cohesiveness of the uh, Pyongyang? Sorry. Right. That's really, that's really a great question. Um, so just to clarify a little bit, when I talk about bottom-up change, that's not necessarily a revolution. That's just meaning that ultimately change will be driven by these bottom-up changes, right? So even an opening up and liberalization of the system, the North Korean government wouldn't do that unless they were forced to do that, basically. Right? If there, were, if there wasn't change, if there weren't weaknesses, if they were basically in control, then they would be much happier just sitting on, sitting on it. Because liberalization is risky. Right? Whenever they open something up, something goes wrong, and you know, uh, there's some kind of, it seems there's some kind of like downstream unintended consequence in the direction of losing control in some way. Uh, so the, if, if they could just have it the way they want, then they would just sit on it and maintain the current system. But if they see these long-term inevitable changes that they're going to have to adapt to somehow, that's the way that they might be forced to actually uh, enter into these kind of policy changes. So for instance, that might be, it's becoming increasingly clear that the current economic governance system is unsustainable in the long run. When you have China accelerating away, South Korea accelerating away, the people increasingly aware of their relative backwardness, it makes it really tempting for the North Korean government to be like, okay, maybe we'll just, you know, have this new improved, you know, what they call it, new improved economic management system. They're never going to call it reforms, but they can like kind of have some innovation within that. It does actually seem like they're doing that, by the way, um, and it's baby steps and it's experimentation and it's zonal. But it does seem like there's been some decollectivization of agriculture policy and also uh, some experiments with factory management within the system. Again, I, you know, some of this is uh, available in other open sources. I've also heard about it from recent defenses as well. We shouldn't be too excited. This is the kind of thing that's happened before and they could roll it back. But it does suggest that they are uh, experimenting with these kind of ways to maybe try and improve the economy while still maintain, maintaining control over it. Specifically on the coup d'etat thing, uh, it's obviously just extremely hard to know. You know, anybody that says, I think, that you know, they know exactly what's happening in the corridors of power in Pyongyang is maybe, I don't know, they, they're a shamanist or something, or I don't, know, I don't know if they're using traditional political science methods. Um, but. Uh, that wasn't an intended slide on anybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any, anybody in mind. Um, but, you know, one thing is that Kim Jong-un and, uh, and you know, his leadership team have done an incredible churn of, you know, uh, the, the top, top level of power, as far as we know. You know. He's been in power for two, three years, and the number of demotions and, you know, promotions and purges is, been kind of incredible. He, in a way, he had to do that because he just wholesale inherited his father's system. He only had really like a couple of years to prepare for that power. Contrast to Kim Jong Il, he was preparing for power for like seventeen years, uh, and he, you know, he had more of his own system. He had more of his own power base. So in a way, he's dealing with you know a big challenge in developing his own power base, and he's doing it very quickly, and it seems to be successful for the time being. So maybe that explains why 
his you know his uh, power politics is a lot more rapid and may in some ways seem like less uh, efficiently managed than Kim Jong Il because it did seem like Kim Jong Il was really effective in just you know playing playing people off, uh, against each other and putting people out to the pastures for a while um, and letting them come back in. Um, whereas the Jang Song type purge is the obvious one. That seems like a lot more hasty and like loads of publicity and a little bit um, a little bit out of control maybe. If it continues like that, then who knows, maybe you will have a coup d'etat type situation arising. Uh, it's you know there have been kind of those kind of threats in the North Korean system before. In those kind of authoritarian systems, you always have, you know, you don't always have, but you often have some kind of threat towards the leadership. Um, even in South Korea, you know, Park Chung Hee was all of a sudden assassinated. Like you don't, you never know quite what's going to happen in that kind of thing. One thing though is that uh, the North Korean leadership is very kind of on top of that. Like they're very paranoid, and they put a lot of investment into their internal security forces. Uh, in order to try and root out those kind of coups. So there's a, there would be a really high risk for any power faction to try and launch a coup, and the potential benefits to doing that don't seem to be that clear. You know, I wouldn't necessarily want to try and inherit, uh, inherit that system if I was there. You know, I'd probably be more likely to jump ship, basically. It's the real wild card type thing though, you know? Like if there is a coup d'etat, then that is the kind of thing that could change things really quickly. It's just hard to know. It's just like the um, it's like a black swan event type thing. Uh, hi Saki, uh, it's me, Dan. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the, the monetary, like if we send money to North Korea, how that actually gets transferred. Obviously I don't think they have ATM machines there or Western Union or uh, Citibank, but uh, um, does it go through brokers, usually through China, through Beijing, right. in a form of hard currency, or is it is it there's some sort of electronic service or yeah, any currency like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears> that kind of is an ATM, but but it's a human ATM. So you uh, imagine you know young North Korean guy uh, arrives in South Korea, maybe he's the first person from his family to arrive here, early twenties. First of all. Arriving in South Korea, he's gone through six months of compulsory government processing through the NIS and Hanawon, and that's all with other North Koreans. So he's already plugged into the North Korean diaspora in South Korea. That makes it really easy for him to get a, uh, or makes it relatively easy for him to get a, uh, it's called like a recommendation to a good broker, right? And uh, and uh, and this would be, you know, in this case, a remittance broker, somebody they can send money back home. Uh, there's different ways that the money actually travels, but basically the money ends up going from Seoul to a bank account in China. And then you have the owner of that bank account often being a Korean Chinese person, a Pagyo, who has the right to reside inside North Korea. So they're sitting in North Korea and they have a bank account in China and they have a phone. And so, when they're on the North Korean side of the border as well, they can check the bank, uh, what's it called, bank, you know what I mean, level of money that they have. Bank balance, that's right, <laughs> 10 points. Um, they, they can check their bank balance by telephone. So that's pretty much instantaneous, right? Wiring money from South Korea to China, and then checking your bank balance by phone is all pretty much instantaneous. And then all you need to do is, He's already sitting on cash, that's why he's a human ATM. He's sitting on, you know, thousands of RMB, uh, potentially Chinese Yuan. And then he takes a cut, maybe 10%. He gives the rest, uh, you know, $900 to a local uh, money courier, who will be normally a North Korean person. And then that person takes that money to the family. Uh, that could be within the space of an hour, if they're in the same town. Could be even faster. And then one phone call back from that money courier or from the family back to their relatives in South Korea confirms banks got the money, you know, the broker didn't screw us over. And so it's all, it's all potentially done within the space of minutes. Often it's like next day delivery, um, but it's still not bad. You know, there's, 
there's a bit of commission and there's a, there's a bit of risk because it's all very informal. But at this point, it's a multi-million dollar industry and the, the brokers involved in this are relying on their reputation. And so it's in their interest to carry on doing business in a good way. Yeah, like, you know, this, we, we're, we, you can be very confident that this $15 million is going to the North Korean people. Because if it wasn't, then North Korean refugees wouldn't be sending it. It's North Korean refugees themselves who are ensuring that accountability. Hi, uh, this is my first time here. Another speaker might have covered it before, I'm not sure, but uh, it seems like a lot of the organizations who are trying to help North Korea also support unification. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, I mean, I've read a little bit about it, but I'm curious what you think about South Korea being able to, to handle that, you know, that new influx of millions upon millions of people, how the government handled that. Uh, <laughs> so it's, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's just impossible. Um, it, it depends so much on when reunification happens, how it happens, you know, what the conditions, is there, is there an internal conflict in North Korea at the time, something that's really, you know, damn, like bloodshed basically, that's the kind of thing that moves millions of people pretty quickly. Um, there's, there's so many factors that it's really hard to say. Um, once you start studying the kind of, you know, downstream problems that might come from reunification, there's almost no end. Once you identify something, it's like, oh, this could happen in this way, in this way, and that could create all of these problems, and then when that problem happens, it could have these problems. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, but it's not necessarily insurmountable. I mean, you know, uh, East and West Germany obviously reunified. I, be, I, by the way, like, don't know if reunification is going to happen. Like, I, I, again, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I can foresee situations where it doesn't happen, or it doesn't happen for a very long time, or it happens in very different circumstances where North Korea is, you know, much more developed than it is right now, for instance. Um, so I'm not. I'm not like drawing a conclusion that it's inevitable just because I don't have the confidence to say that. Yeah. Thanks for your speech. Very informative, as expected. Um, can I disagree with something you said and then ask no. to respond? <laughs> That's my question. So. This gives me an excuse to make a well, it's that, well, you're only allowed one question, so that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say yes, but then you can't have a follow-up question. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> you mentioned in your speech that uh, the regime in North Korea, Kim Jong Un, maintains the line that it's material, but materially better off mm -hmm. than the South. Um, I want to disagree with that, mm -hmm. and I think that in the face of, in, of a sustained and large number of defections the increase of information, both of these things of which you covered, the regime has to kind of admit. And I think perhaps, and this is my opinion, that via these so-called double defective press conferences, the regime has effectively communicated uh, a new line, a new narrative, mm -hmm. which says, yes, the South is materially better off, uh, they are wealthier than we are, but if you defect and you go to South Korea, you will be a lower class. You will be, you know, forfeiting uh, the comfort that you have here at home, under the loving embrace of the supreme leader, and you will be submitting yourself to discrimination, etc., so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Do you show? Sure. You yes. So, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. So uh, that That's line was important. maybe yeah. That line was you know um, a little bit simplistic, right? But the the basic you know the fundamental propaganda and the traditional propaganda in North Korea is that there's, you know, there's some kind of socialist paradise that they're living in and capitalism is horrible, right? Like that's the traditional propaganda. I totally agree though that they have adapted that and they've, you know, uh, they've innovated on that. So at this point, you know, again, North Korean refugees say that 
only babies would think that North Korea is actually like a rich country compared to its neighbors. Everybody knows it at this point. Children and upwards. Um, so it's an open secret, basically. You know, it's still not like cool politically to go around saying like, hey, isn't South Korea so much richer? Although it's, a, it's a, a lot easier to say that about China, actually, because it's like not seen as the enemy. It's not really politically subversive to talk about how China's maybe, you know, uh, different and, and richer in some ways than, than North Korea. So it's an open secret, and the North Korean government has had to adapt to that. Um, and it doesn't really, you know, in its day-to-day -day propaganda, it doesn't really say that South Korea is poorer than North Korea anymore. In children's textbooks, it might still say that, because that's really difficult to change, uh, children's textbooks. It's thought to be, have to be that guy in the Ministry of Education and be like, hey, this seems outdated, should we change this bit? Um, but, if, you know, K, you know, uh, KCTV or Rosen Shimun or whatever, it's a lot easier to just gradually kind of ignore the fact that South Korea is actually richer and move on to different criticisms like South Korea is, you know, a crony of US imperialism and uh, South Korea is a very corrupt society and has different kinds of human rights problems like high suicide rate and that kind of stuff. They've had to adapt and move on to other criticisms. That actually shows uh, the potential power of, again, improving information access to the North Korean people. So the more you do that, the more you kind of, um, the more you increase North Korean people's awareness of reality, of the outside world, and of their own country, the, the harder it is to maintain this, you know, baseline of propaganda. It's really, they, they, they find that they have to kind of pull up towards that reality. And then once they pull up towards that reality and align the propaganda lines more closely with the actual perceived reality, which is the only way to go in the long term, eventually you're going to have to start delivering on some of that kind of stuff. So that's how I interpret, for instance, Kim Jong-un coming in and fairly quickly talk, you know, talking up economic development. No, we're not going to have to you know, tighten our belts anymore. We're you know, uh, having these different ways that we're going to uh, produce economic development. There's relatively more emphasis on economic development now than under Kim Jong-il. Uh, you're moving away, I would argue, from military first to like slight military first, like slightly less first, still kind of first, but, uh, but also you know, economic development. The whole idea of putting economic development and military first as a parallel objective is a de facto, you know, raising and relative lowering of uh, military first as opposed to economic development. You know what I mean? And and in the long term, I see that as a reaction to the fact that like the people are increasingly aware of these kinds of things. The last point is, you know, there was a, I think the New York Times reported it last year that there was an, you know, a few interesting lines that Kim Jong Un put out in a speech to uh, party officials, and he basically said that really paraphrasing, but he basically said um, it doesn't really matter when you know you have political rallies and people chanting for the Korean Workers' Party in Pyongyang. What we have to have is people in far-flung islands and deep mountain valleys chanting for the Korean Workers' Party. And the only way to do that is to improve economic prosperity. Again, again paraphrasing, that's basically what he said. And that kind of shows, you know, uh, an awareness of these kind of changes and the fact that he's not taking the loyalty of the people for granted and he realizes that in the long term you need uh, legitimacy through economic prosperity and, and development. Any last question? Rob, I think it might be you. <laughs> Thing, yeah, yeah, that's really good. Anytime. Hi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I look after the... Hi, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Young Rock Kim. I look after the Media Dissemination Project in um, 
and in KSC. So my one question is, since you emphasized the importance of um, information that goes into North Korea, on a lighter note, if you had one movie, one piece of drama to sort of, um, that you'd like to send into North Korea, mm -hmm. what would it be? Because I'm, I'm kind of short on ideas at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on the lighter note, I prefer like a joke line to that one. Um, on the, maybe on the more serious note, I think that it's important that it's not basically like reverse propaganda. Uh, it's better if it's just like broadly, you know, uh, increasing the diversity of information that's available. One of the reasons uh, why, pro why I don't think that just like reverse propaganda is effective is because North Koreans, there's a, there's a certain expectation that media is propaganda and that foreign media is anti-North Korean system propaganda. And if you throw that in, then you're just kind of reinforcing that idea and encouraging people to reject it, in fact. And they'll be like, oh, crap, like, uh, Kurt asked me not to swear. Um, <laughs> they'll be like, oh, crap, uh, you know, the Rolling Shimmel is right. You know, this uh, impure media is designed to overthrow our system. Whereas if it's just like, you know, broadly uh, entertainment or educational type stuff, um, then when you watch a few of them, it's really clear that it's not, it doesn't have like a political message in there. Uh, and in fact, that's why it's really popular to the North Korean people. Because not, this is one of the things I didn't say, but one of the reasons why foreign media is so, there's such a high demand, and there is a really high demand and it's not being met, that's why information summation is really good because you're fulfilling a need uh, that's not being met right now, it's un so this is an under-resourced thing. Um, one of the reasons why it's a, such a high demand, even though there is a risk, is partly because North Korean state media is so terrible. Right? It's like so old-fashioned, it's so stuffy. You know, North Korean refugees say, like, use the word, uh, you know, like, oh, that's just, right? And it's, it's repeats, and you watch the first five minutes, you know how it's going to end. It's going to end with Kim Il-sung being awesome, <laughs> and the Americans losing, and the people sacrificing for the socialist revolution, like one of those three things, probably. Um, so when you watch a South Korean drama, which is just about like people's lives, uh, and it's a very, you know, you get, you incidentally learn things about South Korean society, like everybody has a car, and all the guys are really tall, and they always open the door for girls. <laughs> Everybody's in, you know, weird relationships and loses their memory at some point, or whatever. Um, it's not all real, obviously. Uh, but, it's fascinating. It's like amazing entertainment for you. Um, I would, you know, so, so to get to a little bit more of a concrete answer, I would say that stuff which is not, you know, really, not like really propagandistic or likely to, see, to be seen as really subversive, but is maybe, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit more than the dramas and films that are getting in anyway, just by supply and demand, and by, you know, smugglers going, you know, taking that stuff from China. Um, one way of looking at it is basically, like, your PBS or the BBC compared to, like, HBO. Like, you have a bit more of an educational role, you know? <laughs> So basically, BBC documentaries is what I'm saying. No, just <laughs> and time for just one more question. Can you take it? You actually mentioned uh, Syria, which was a very interesting case mm -hmm. because I think throughout history we have seen, uh, you know, beginning with the Magna Carta uh, with England, uh, the overthrow of monarchies and, uh, you know, oligarch oligarchies and uh, these types of systems which, which failed the people, the mass majority of the people. Um, so, I mean, when we look at now, let's take this to North Korea. Uh, how uh, effective, I guess, do we, do we see this uh, oligarchy, uh, this, this man-made system, 
uh, taking control over these provinces, like you know, in Rajin or Hezan. I mean, they're very, very autonomous right now with with the free markets. Um, and uh, if if the regime is losing control of it over these uh, provinces, I mean, is there uh, a, a probability that you know this kind of revolution can happen, like we've seen, you know, in these uh, Middle Eastern countries recently? Um, is that a possibility? And, uh, yeah, just how much effective control, I guess, does this uh, oligarchy have over its people? I mean, they're always threatening us with nuclear mm -hmm. weapons and stuff like that, but to the average people, is, yeah, is that effective in, in controlling them? Yes. Um, so, uh, North Korea is a, a fairly small country, obviously, geographically. Uh, in population, you know, 24 million is not bad, but it's not huge either. Um, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say that the North Korean government doesn't have control over the provinces in like a political way. It's not like the provinces are acting independently, like just being run by warlords that are out of the control of Pyongyang. You know, it's not quite like that. It's more that at a local level, you know, like if the governor of, uh, you know, Hamgyong uh, was like, hey, we're going to do things totally different here, then he'd be dead pretty quickly. You know, like there's that, there's that level of control, there's those lines of power and control uh, to the central government. Um, but then the other part of your question was like the, the chance of a revolution or something like that. Um, it's a, you know, I would say that it doesn't seem like there's the conditions right now. It doesn't seem like there's enough of you don't necessarily need to have like really strong organization, but organization really helps. And it's one of those things that turns like, you know, that, that's like a game changer basically. Um, but you know, with the with the effectiveness of the North Korean government, central government's control over public politics, uh, and the you know the high, very high risk and low you know perceived hope of pushing for a political change seems like it's not going to happen anytime really soon but then you know 10 years 15 years like this kind of time frame out into the future that's really where you don't know what's going to happen and the other thing that i would add is you know even with all that being said you really don't know what's going to happen like you know tunisia uh, obviously exploded and kind of uh, like you know forest fire type uh, public ups uprising, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really led by organizations. It was one guy who set himself on fire and then that turned, you know, just turned people out into the street and it became, you know, um, unsustainable for the leader to stay in power. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to have, um, if you, if you look at other cases in history, you know, the French Revolution, for instance, it wasn't like they had like a whole bunch of, you know, solid organizations that were pushing for, for change. Um, even, and, and you know, it's maybe interesting to look at South Korea's democratization history as well. In 1960, popular uprising forced out East and Mai. 1960, South Korea is, in some ways, you know, there's parallels to North Korea right now. You don't need the internet to do these things, obviously. You know, Twitter and that kind of stuff, social media, can be uh, a facilitating factor, but obviously you don't need it, right? So <coughs> some people sometimes say North Korea doesn't have Twitter and the internet, so it's not gonna happen. It's obviously not true, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't have seen any kind of popular uprising until like five years ago. Um, so, and, and, and one thing on the, on the plus side of the ledger for the North Korean people is that they have mobile phones. Right, or, or um, the top 10% of people, maybe two to three million people, have mobile phones, and that's something that can accelerate information flows and communication between people. Obviously, uh, so they, you know, they, they lack in some ways, but they have, you know, some things that South Koreans didn't have in 1960s. Um, it still seems like it's not gonna. They don't really have the conditions, but it's really like uh, political scientists are really bad at seeing these kind of changes happening. So I think that it's always just a little bit better to say, actually, you know, just be like intellectually humble about it and say, actually, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Uh, but have like vague, you know, like these, um, this, this kind of model might be relevant to understand this.
it's really unsatisfying, but I think that's more credible in the long run.